Hi, welcome to More Christ. I'm Marcus. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Joshua Fernell. Josh is an assistant professor of systematic theology at St. Patrick's Pont Pontifical University here in Ireland at Maynooth. And his main re research in interests are in 19th and 20th century continental philosophy and systematic theology. In particular, he's interested in modern philosophical engagements in Christian theology and the relationship between Christian thought and contemporary culture. His brilliant book, Catholic Theology After Kierkegaard, was published by Oxford University Press. And it's this book that I'd like to really home in on today, but also allow that to work as a tangent to some other work. So um, I suppose, first of all, just how did you come to love these wonderful topics, philosophy and theology and this way of life then? Well, uh that's a good question. Mm -hmm. I, ha I had good friends uh, who were asking difficult questions at, at formative stages, uh, and we were always pushing each other with these questions. And, and we grew up um, in, so in sort of a religious context, but one that w was limited in certain ways and very fruitful in others. And, and there was the philosophy that would, that would edge us out sort of to the edges of, of certain questions, and we would just pursue those. Uh, together and then eventually it came around to deciding well should we formalize these questions in sort of research directions and um, yeah some friends of mine went towards philosophy and I just kept going towards theology so I'm sort of a theologian who did does the theology stuff but I also like to read philosophy so I find myself in conversations with philosophers believers and unbelievers and trying to foster uh, dialogue between the two camps uh, and keep the conversation open. Uh, and so I try to do that interdisciplinary in an interdisciplinary way, but also a confessional way. So my work on Kierkegaard and Catholic theology um, and yeah, just it's, it's great to be able to find conversation partners. Cause I think that's sort of where the interest can emerge. And I, I try to do that with my students as well in, in the classroom uh, that, it, that, it, that the the friendship and the conversation is very much an essential part of, of the learning. Yeah, that's wonderful. And um, before we started recording, we talked a bit about your background, but I'd love to, to ask you for the benefit of my viewers where you were before Ireland and how your experiences in, in academia or even in different countries have helped to shape the Christian man that you are today then. Yeah, it's, I, I've, been I, with my wife and I, we've lived in several different countries, but I, I did my uh, graduate postgraduate studies in England uh, at Durham University, and uh, that was a great opportunity and had a postdoctoral position there uh, and then went back for about a year to the States and taught on religious existentialism at, at Dartmouth College uh, and got to go to St. Olaf's College where they have a nice Kierkegaard library and um, took a Danish class there and did some more research during that year. And then this job came up and the academic job market is 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 worse now than it was <laughs> when I was at that time. And it was still pretty bad when I was going through it. But finally, uh, it, a job came open for us uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and we were there for seven years. Um, and just this past year or so, we, we left the Netherlands and came to Ireland. Um, and it's, it's been a kind of a whirlwind uh, European tour, but, um, but a good one. No, excellent. I'm glad to have you with us here in Ireland too. I'm, I'm very excited about some of the things that we might work on together. But uh, I want to go to now your key influences or anyone who's been especially inspirational for you. Could you tell us about some key figures then? Yeah, I mean, besides just reading Catholic, the Catholic theologians of the 20th century um, and then trying to find how they plug in with the 19th century uh, thinker of Soren Kierkegaard. Um, I guess some of the real formative conversation partners for me have been um, someone who's just passed away recently uh, is Father David Burrell. Uh, he's a philosopher and theologian um, who wrote on Thomas Aquinas, but also was uh, influenced by Wittgenstein, Ludwig Wittgenstein. And um, I've been in conversation with him uh, before, up until his passing as well. Um, but uh, I don't know. I've, I've really 
kept the the influences fluid, like reading Joseph Pieper, uh, Romano Guardini, um, uh, reading from the Anglican tradition, Rowan Williams, um, uh, Eric Mascal. Um, there's there's just loads of, of different people, and and along the way, I've, I I had encountered um, the Italian Thomas uh, Cornelio Fabro, and have just been really trying to come to grips with how he can hold together all what he knows, but then also keep the conversation between Thomism and, and the Kierkegaardian perspective um, in the same person. So I've been trying to figure that out. That's what my next book is going to be about. Um, so I don't know. Those are just some names off of the top of my head. I'm sure there are many others. I could look at, I just was looking at my bookshelf, seeing who else is, <laughs> is on here. Um, um, but yeah, I could, I could go on. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, Josh. And um, I'm, I'm delighted you mentioned Father Cornelio Fabro because as, as we mentioned before we started recording, I had a few comments from a uh, Thomas guy in, on one of my videos and um, he corrected some things that uh, Bernardo Castro, I think, who is doing great work in many ways, but I don't think he's um, entirely orthodox in his Christian theology, let's say. So I was I was appreciative of that, and that sort of took me in that direction. I learned a bit more about him, and I'm excited by the work that you're doing in that regard. But um, I want to home in now again on Kierkegaard, who you mentioned, and who, to whom your book is centrally focused around. What first drew you to him, and why does this great kind of Christian philosopher really command your attention? Then, <laughs> oh, he's I. I don't know. It, it, it. I mean, he has an acquired taste, I suppose. But I, I think it has to do mainly it goes back to to the shock of reading *Fear and Trembling* as a, as a young university student, and just reading his take on Abraham and Isaac, and trying to come to grips with the dramatic approach that he takes to faith. That faith isn't just something that's automatic or taken for granted, but it's something that's actually dramatic that has to be sort of embraced um even at a, in an extreme sense or whatever so i think that's how many university students are introduced to Kierkegaard. but um i think just all throughout just sort of what i was reading i just kept kept reading and his his works are difficult with the pseudonyms and different and different things so but i found that he was a, th a thinker that would reward the investment that you'd make um and then coming across his spiritual writings, his Christian discourses, um, his writings, edifying discourses on the lily and the birds. I, I just found him a very biblical thinker uh, in, in sort of almost a rabbinic way, like Midrash in, in a way, but in, in a faithful thinker. But he was also deeply versed in post-Kantian philosophy. And so I, I would receive a philosophical education by reading him. Um, and also in the arts and, and learning about Mozart or um, the aesthetic point of view that he brings through um, and the different literature that he mentions. Um, so there's just, to me, he's sort of an encyclopedic author that you can receive an education by, by pressing on with him. Uh, and yeah, hopefully retain your faith at the end of it too. So <laughs> that's, that's, he was, he was just a rewarding person that, that I, I would always come back to. I couldn't just set him down saying, okay, now I've, 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 I understand what he's up to. Now I'm on to something else. Um, he was just someone that I would always come back to. I appreciate that. And I think um, that's interesting in light of some of the things that I've seen successful that had broad appeal on my channel. They, you see some of these figures like Castro, like uh, Jonathan Pajot, and um, they are pointing to, a life of faith beyond the kind of merely prepositional. And I think uh, to your point, Kierkegaard is really helpful in that direction. It's kind of um, exposing some of the pretensions of kind of modern secularism and um, think the idea that things are self-evident or neutral that we might come to later. But um, oh, before that, I want to ask you a little bit about the reception in, uh, uh, towards Kierkegaard. Like, what has that been in broad strokes, if we may, amongst Catholics, say, say and even amongst other Christians? Then? Yeah, I mean, at first I thought it was just kind of like um, uh, a superficial thing that I thought I was reading into 
um, like uh, these authors as I was reading them, like Honor de Lubac or uh, Romano Guardini or Hansers von Balthazar or Eve Congar, um, Eric Paterson. There's, there's just I, I just started encountering these various Catholic thinkers, and at, at first I thought it was just a superficial uh, connection that this was just a, a part of the times. Everybody's reading Sartre at this point in time, so existentialism is you know they're in France and this is just part of the culture, which it indeed was, but they weren't, they were, they were reading critically. The, the Catholic theologians were preferring Kierkegaard to Nietzsche or Kierkegaard to Sartre. Um, and uh, in some cases reading deeply. So uh, I've just finished uh, writing one uh, article on Henri de Lubac in the French um Oh, it's the the atheistic humanism book that that de Lubac wrote, but I'm positioning it because one of his reviewers was uh, Maurice Blanchot, who is big on this sort of non. It's like a non humanistic perspective of atheism. So they are sort of like anti humanist. It's like they have a negative anthropology, but they're not pro humanism because they think that that's sort of a problem. So it's sort of like a anti natalist. Uh, philosophical worldview before that sort of has taken off as it has more recently with the different transhumanist stuff. But I, I situate de Lubach's reading of Kierkegaard in this as important and significant um, because it's a faith-filled perspective that is not, um, um, he has, I, he, he's not, I wouldn't call him pessimistic against human nature, but he's definitely aware of, of sin and, and, the detriments of it, and he and he doesn't start with that. He has a full sort of theology of creation and goodness that sort of buttresses this as sort of a deviation from it. So it's not the beginning and end of the story. Um, and so I think a lot of these Catholic authors were gravitating toward Kierkegaard, not just because he was a Protestant thinker and something different and unique, but um, he was offering something in the modern age that was rare, and he was anticipating some of these moves that were happening in the 20th century around the World War II. Um, and so just trying to line them all up together and view it in a cumulative way, uh, I was trying to um, make the case that Catholics were reading beyond their ken uh, prior to the Second Vatican Council. And, um, and even strangely, I met, you know, encountered figures like Cornelio Fabro, who was a Thomist, who you would think that that doesn't go together with this sort of rationalistic approach to things. And this irrational, typically irrational thinker. So I've been trying to sort of bring all these folks together and see what story can be told uh, as a result. Yeah, that's excellent. Thank you, Josh. And then how can we view and appreciate Kierkegaard in um, this at least small C Catholic light uh, inspired by, by the likes of de Lubac and this kind of resourcement and um, where does he fit within the great tradition from the biblical times through the patristic era, medieval age until now? And I think in some ways that from if I re I'm reading your work correctly, um, he fits organically, even though he could critique uh, Christendom and so on. He does fit within the, a like an orthodox Christian tradition. I'd love you to speak that as I think in some ways it reminds me of um, my friend, Dr. Jens Zimmermann has done some great work on Bonhoeffer and uh, sh sh some new light on him. I think you've done the same for Kierkegaard. That yeah, no, I think Kierkegaard's sort of like, um, I don't know, he, he's like an example of, of all of those different things. Like he, he, he brings the biblical perspective. He's got patristic authors like Tertullian and, 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 um, and other folks. And then like, I've, I've written recently on, on Hugh of St. Victor in the, in the medieval age and how Kierkegaard is reading him on the Holy Spirit. Uh, and on issues of sanctification. Um, so he, he has this broad approach and, and it, it, it is limited, um, but it, it's sufficiently part of the tradition. And I think Kierkegaard is interesting to read theologically in that way, because he is sort of exhibiting what it means to embody a tradition uh, in such a way that you maintain constancy amid the change that's happening. And, and, and I think he's sort of trying to dramatize that and, and exhibit that for us. And he does have Catholic sources that he's using. Um, and 
and I'm trying to sort of amplify those uh, in order to sort of show, and, and that's definitely what the resource fund guys were interested in as well, trying to retrieve these sources to get back behind some of the uh, different uh, textbook understandings of things, um, trying to get back to the sources. And I think Kierkegaard was trying to do that with human existence um, mm -hmm. and faith. Excellent. And then I suppose to that, um, to that end, what is distinct about his theological anthropology or his view of the human and so on, as we may describe it in common terms, especially at a time when we do seem to fluctuate between that kind of wild transhumanism that you talked about and this antinatalism, and it seems to have trickled down even to popular culture by this stage. You see it every day with the kind of uh, just stop oil people are like very anti-human see elon musk and people like that kind of shilling for transhumanism on twitter and this kind of predominantly secular society then yeah I, I mean if you if you think of a sort of a a, a philosophical anthropology of, of personalism uh he's you know he's, his emphasis on the individual against the system or against the collective against the crowd um that that is rooted theologically in the image of God tradition that, that humans have dignity, and individually so. Even though we have to become human is something that we are and that we must become as well. And Christ provides an example for how one becomes more authentically human for Kierkegaard. Um, it's it's rooted not just in his Christology, but also goes back to his view of creation too. So. His, his famous uh, work, The Sickness Unto Death, his emphasis on the self is the self-relating relation unto itself. He's playing around with the Hegelian language there. Um, but he says that it has to rest transparently in the power that established it. Uh, now, Sartre reads that in a, in a way that's sort of imminentized, that, that that's just sort of like your parents sort of gift you that piece of life or whatever. But Kierkegaard, I think, has a theological uh, understanding of this, um, that is consonant with the christian tradition and how and and the, and and the judaism and and islam for that matter with the emphasis on creation that that we are before god and accountable to god the creator and um this is something that i think is worth drawing out because i think it permeates his whole notion of being before god is this notion of learning to trust in divine providence and that's how our hopes is oriented uh in the present and um our faith is is rested in the promises that he has issued in the past as well so uh it's it's definitely rooted in in the creator's goodness and and the that will carry uh, us through the trials um that we face here and now um so it is something that is different and i think he he Kierkegaard anticipates some key uh, debates that we're facing today, and even and he saw it back in the 19th century emerging. So he was very keen uh, and very wise to sort of take the positions that he did. Um, and I think part of that work is that remains today is to try to figure out how to put that into an updated format to to let him continue to speak today. Mm, excellent. And um, yeah, one thing we touched upon before we started recording, which I want to explore more with you, is you've been working on um, Kierkegaard and his diamond, aka guardian angel, if you watch my conversation with uh, Jonathan Marzo and Bernardo Castro. And uh, Jonathan, being an Orthodox Christian, was kind of adamant that you should be lifted up by your guardian angel. And there is um, there's a tell us and there's a direction that we're meant to go to towards the kingdom and so on. But um, Bernardo tried to suggest that his daemon was a uh, neutral, like morally neutral and so on. And he has this tendency, as much as I appreciate some of his work, to, to deify nature in um, a way that I've never found convincing. I wonder if you might speak to that and how that differs from our um, Christian perspective that you're referring to and how we understand the, the creature and the creation. Um, as kind of we receive these gifts from God and does that make sense? Yeah. So it is. Um, yes. So I, I have, I've been trying to um, 
another thing that I've I've been working on, I presented a paper on on Carl Jung and Soren Kierkegaard on the diamond, comparing their points of view because Carl Jung is dismissive of Kierkegaard, um, and and thinks that he's just something like Karl Barth, and he doesn't have any time for that. Uh, he thinks that that's sort of a a neurotic, a religious neurotic position. Uh, so he's dismissive. But I, I've been trying to sort of bring Kierkegaard back into this discussion on the issue of the diamond and specifically the Socratic aspect of it, um, which I think is probably where the neutrality part comes out, that the, that the phrase daimonic in, in the Greek is, it's difficult to know if it's sort of an adjective or a substantive, like just grammatically, it's, it's a weird way, of, or it's a weird word um, that something could be described as daimonic or the, the di daimonic could have a reference to something, but Kierkegaard plays with this ambiguity um, and and ties it in also into the of course the angelic uh, direction that um, with a, with his work on anxiety, but then there's also a daimonic component too. Um, but Kierkegaard root, roots this in terms of of, of good and evil uh, in in his work of the concept of, of anxiety, and I suppose what I have been interested to draw out is how Kierkegaard explicitly relies on this comparison between Socrates and Christ. And, and he distinguishes the two, um, but then tries to sort of have another maneuver of how the pagan and the Christian are still somehow related. Uh, and so I think there, are, there is more things to reflect on, on this topic. And especially in the, if you're reading Kierkegaard in English, a lot of the times he uses the phrase daimonic, it gets translated as demonic. And so that, already sort of twists it in, in a negative direction. Um, so, uh, and Carl Jung has a different sort of register for this as well, um, but I, I'm trying to sort of find the common point of departure um, on this topic in order to open up the register of the soul, um, which I think Kierkegaard has an operative understanding of and that that opens up the psychological elements uh, to a ground of the soul, which would be the creator, the power that establishes the self-relating relation and things like that. So I think there's still certain maneuvers that could be done using Kierkegaard in this space to facilitate a discussion between psychology, philosophy, and theology. Um, We'll have we'll have to wait and see uh, how this emerges, but this is just a hunch that I'm uh, testing out at this moment. Mm, excellent, thank you, Joshua. And um, can you tell us a little bit more about the kind of Kierkegaard Renaissance in Europe and how he impressed upon figures like Romano, Romano Gardini, who you mentioned before? I suppose especially because he's maybe in some cases most known for things like the liturgy and they might not necessarily see the Kierkegaard influence on him and I think especially interesting also is the fact that he in turn was a seminal influence on figures even like um, Pope Benedict no less and I wonder if you might speak to that <laughs> and and Pope Francis and Pope Francis yeah. as well uh, Francis was gonna he didn't finish his doctorate but he started out working on Guardini but Guardini is hugely influential he was teaching on Kierkegaard in the 30s uh, in Berlin, and that was at the same time that Hannah Arendt was th was there. Abraham Joshua Heschel was there in town. Uh, Hans Urs von Balthasar was studying uh, under Guardini, uh, and and he was teaching on Kierkegaard. He he was reading the con concluding on scientific postscript, um, and maybe philosophical crumbs as well. The the Johannes Climacus uh, authorship. So. Um, uh, but Guardini was interested in the in the Christ and culture questions uh, at that point in time, and um, for I mean for obvious reasons. So the uh, with the during the Nazi period, um, and and raising the question just like Eric Shavaro was raising this question, uh, Karl Barth, the whole there was a whole lot of of, of not, I mean, there was a few important Christian theologians that were raising this question of Christ and culture uh, in critical ways, and Guardini was one of them. And what's interesting about Guardini and Shavara during this period is is their interest in Kierkegaard to, to do this. Um, that Kierkegaard was someone who was trying to get above the collective and, and have a sense of the absolute that transcends the universal. Um, and 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 gives life to the universal and and has a has a direct connection also to the particular the individual as well. 
Um, so yeah, Guardini is definitely, his, his work on the liturgy is hugely important. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, we can't only remember Guardini for the liturgy. Um, we have to remember his work on Pascal, on Dante, uh, on, on Holderlin. Um, I mean, Guardini, he, he got a job that, was, that Martin Heidegger was supposed to get, but he didn't. And he, there's a sort of animosity that, between them at that point in time as well. So he's, he's a hugely influential and important figure. Um, I highly recommend people uh, get back and, re and read his works. Um, just, yeah, he was so influential on, on Joseph Ratzinger and on Pope Francis um, and, and many other uh, people as well. Um, Joseph Pieper as well. Um, so I don't know, was, was there something specific? Uh, you asked me about the European um, inheritance of this. Were there other aspects that you wanted to uh, hear about? Yeah, I'd also like to hear about um, his impact, uh, not just with the Gordini, but on cardinals like uh, Jean Danielou and Yves Kangar, who then were integral to the Second Vatican Council, and how the spirit of Kierkegaard uh, might have informed that <laughs> council. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Guardini, Theodore Hacker is another important figure. He was a translator of Kierkegaard into German at this time. Um, or uh, Haker, how, however you want to pronounce it, um, and Eric Peterson as well. He, this is he's another uh, important figure uh, in this conversation too. People who are reading Kierkegaard, doing patristic theology uh, and historical theology, uh, and trying to line up certain uh, connections. But yeah, specifically the, on the cardinals, the Danilu um, and uh, Congar. Uh, Congar was was more interested in the sort of ecumenical side of things that uh, Kierkegaard is a, as sort of a post-Lutheran uh, figure and how uh, Kongar was surprised at, at how much um, Kierkegaard offered that was in, in sympathy with the Catholics and at that point in time. And so Kongar held, held Kierkegaard up as sort of an exemplary Lutheran um, thinker who Catholics should be reading. Um, Dan Lu in his uh, sort of programmatic uh, essay that he he wrote, uh, sort of igniting the manifesto for the resourcement theology, the back to the sources movement. The first part of that essay is on getting back into patristic theology and the biblical sources and languages and all that sort of stuff, which is hugely important for theology. The second part of the essay, which gets overlooked, was his engagement with modern thought, that, that, that you have to have sort of this bifocal approach. And he specifically mentions figures like Dostoevsky, Nietzsche, and Kierkegaard. And so he, he gives a lot of time to, to Kierkegaard in that essay. And so I, I tried to use that as sort of a, a flashpoint of where the, the resourcement movement can, in Catholic theology, can uh, find its textual and historical um, connections and links uh, into conversations with Kierkegaard. Um, now, whether or not people who actually work in that space uh, believe me and, and, and follow in that way, that, that remains to be seen, but at least I've at least linked up some of the textual and historical things so that conversation can proceed uh, when and if that becomes desirable. Mm, that's excellent. Thank you, Joshua. And um, another element I wanted to ask you about was in what manner then is Kierkegaard a kind of theologian of inwardness? And how does this contrast with the kind of popular subjectivism that we we're often familiar with, and which seems to, in many ways, have wreaked havoc in modern life. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, he's definitely in the Augustinian tradition, and and that, but he is trying to reclaim this sense of interiority, um, which goes along with his emphasis on the person, the human person, the dignity of the human person, the individual, all of those things. He's trying to emphasize. Um, but it's not at the expense of he, so he he's he's often misread as sort of this irrational subjectivist uh who has you know there's nothing outside of the world or outside of one's own interiority and he he doesn't go that far um he he definitely has an appreciation for the love of neighbor and the love of god and he's bringing that together so if you read his works of love for instance or or his edifying discourses he's very much open to the 
the ethical aspect of neighbor love, but it's not divorced from the love of God. And he works that out through the interiority of the human person. He has philosophical reasons for doing that because he's trying to uh, reverse uh, Hegel's dismissal of the beautiful soul um, and try to show like, this is actually where you get soul language back in and, um, with the language of the soul, you can also begin to discuss the ground of the soul. And that's where it starts to move in a theological direction rather than just a merely psychological direction. So Kierkegaard's also reading Johannes Tauler, who's a, a famous Dominican uh, theologian. And, and so a lot of work has been done recently um, on uncovering these Catholic sources of Kierkegaard's uh, moral psychology and and sort of how this view of interiority um, is fleshed out in a theological direction and not just in a subjectivist uh, way that would remove him from the, the public sphere. Um, so that would be just be an initial attempt to respond to that. There's probably other things that could be said if you wanna keep asking. No, that's great. Uh, and I'm kind of curious, thank you, Joshua. And I'm cu curious also, as to a bit more with this compliment, complementarity between Kierkegaard and de Lubac, for example, and uh, you point out how influential he was in works like the drama of faith, is humanism and paradoxes of faith. I wonder if you might speak to that and or <laughs> second sort of question, um, speak to how they might both help us to understand God's grace then in a manner that goes beyond the kind of simplistic picture of a lot of pop Christianity then. <laughs> yes so uh yeah i think it's this this notion of a of a a tension that is that belongs to flourishing so the with paradox you get this sense of you know so on a superficial level that's like a logical contradiction is sort of how people take it but de Lubac picks up paradox and and runs it into the christ mystery so that it's the divine mystery that that we're being drawn into through through something like paradox it's not logical contradiction but mystery and and that becomes something that's uh that draws us in as mystery but it doesn't repel us away from it like a logical contradiction would, but it continues to draw us in in order to, to and, and de Lubac refers to Kierkegaard as the theologian of inwardness and the herald of, uh, of transcendence in, in there as well. So, so he's, it's an emphasis that's theologically um, deployed um, toward transcendence uh, and the transcendence of reason and um, philosophy and Hegel's philosophy particular, which would subordinate religion uh, to philosophy uh, in, in his system. Uh, so Kierkegaard's trying to sort of react against these maneuvers and, and open things up using paradox, uh, which Hegel would want to move on to the synthesis point, whereas Kierkegaard's wanting to stay with the tension of the God-man and, and not try to resolve the God-man into sort of a metaphor for humanity writ large, but to, to, to stay with the, the tension of that. And de Lubac runs that into his discussion of, of grace and nature, and uh, which was and still is hugely controversial um, in Thomistic circles, um, because he uses the language of paradox um, that we are somehow, by being created in the image of God, we also have a capacity for God or to respond to God, and that we have a natural desire for God. And, and so for de Lubac, that's a hugely important point that at the set time of the Second Vatican Council, his, his, his works on the Eucharist, uh, but then also his fundamental theology and theological anthropology becomes sort of the key architectural building blocks for uh, some of the maneuvers that happen at the Second Vatican Council theologically um, in these areas. Um, I could say more, but I, is there, is there any follow up uh, that you you want to ask at the, at that point? No, I'm happy for you to go in, in any direction you wish, or I just wanted to sort of reiterate what what you were saying with some musings from uh, what I've been listening to and reading, and a uh, even in cognitive science, if you read someone like McGilchrist, uh, you can mm -hmm. see that paradox is mystery beyond a kind of simplistic scientistic um, picture of the universe that we ha we had for too long in many cases 
and um, Dr. Spencer Clavin likewise goes into quantum mechanics and everything from his classical Christian perspective and shows how I think th these notions of mystery and paradox are being reinforced across different disciplines. And it's, I think it's quite an exciting time in that respect. But if it you is, <laughs> no, it is, it is. And I, and I suppose one area that Kierkegaard becomes useful and in, in bringing him in to talk with the Lubach and, and other Catholic theologians is that there is this resistance to the God of the gaps solution for things. Cause one way of talking about this is, well, it's only temporarily paradoxical, but eventually we'll figure it out just given enough time. And then we'll have, we'll do away with the primitive explanations of religious life um, and, and move on to more scientific discussion. So that's sort of the, the, um, Point of view that Kierkegaard's resisting and and sort of really wanting to uphold the paradox for this reason that no it's it's transcendent so you're you're not going to be able to grasp it sort of a thing so I think these are yeah uh, I, I think it's good to point out how uh, faith and reason and science and uh, theology uh, can find a a contemplative um, meeting point uh, that orients us towards wonder. Um, that, that, that I think that hopefully will become a, a strategic um, point of discussion for to open up new avenues of, of research and and uh, conversations. Mm, wonderful. Thank you, Joshua. And um, I also wanted to ask you about Kierkegaard's um, relationship with the real presence of Christ and the Eucharist and and what he thought about that and communion and why it's important to wrestle with some of his thoughts on this fatal issue. Yeah. So in, in the, in the book, I tried to draw this out that this was another touch point with the Lubach because the Eucharist uh, that the Eucharist makes the church uh, was a huge emphasis that the Lubach emphasized uh, and, and that was carried forward in the second Vatican council. Um, it's not the church that creates the Eucharist, but the Eucharist is, 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 is the foundational mystery that generates everything else. Um, I was I was surprised. I mean, another book of Kierkegaard's that often gets overlooked is his communion discourses on Fridays. He he's a idiosyncratic guy, so he he said he he didn't like to go to church on Sundays, um, but on Fridays because that was when fewer people would go, and and everybody expects people to go to church on Sundays, um, but people who were sort of really uh, dedicated would go on Fridays. He, he just had this sort of idios, idiosyncratic way of, of sort of justifying what he did, I suppose. But um, but in that text, uh, which is often overlooked, but it's been recently translated into English uh, by Sylvia Walsh. I think this was back in 2010 or so. Um, I was astonished to, to just sit and read and 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 how uh, his theology of the Eucharist and reading the, alongside that with Henri de Lubac, how similar uh of points of view that they have that it, that Kierkegaard does have a theology of the real presence he does encounter the voice of Christ and in, in a in you might say a mystical way um but also the pre the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist which is in the history of the Reformation uh, a huge point of depart um a huge debate he doesn't get into the transubstantiation versus consubstantiation stuff no he leaves the terms away and he just wants to talk about the real presence and i think that at the end of the day that's what the real that's what all those terms are supposed to be trying to get to is that that's what is important with the eucharist that we encounter the person of jesus uh in this in this moment and and that was another sort of translation point that his english translators would uh in, import their ecclesiological perspectives. Uh, so you would have references to the communion table, which reflects sort of a congregational um, perspective of, of the sacraments. Um, but Kierkegaard used the word altar, uh, that, that this is an altar um, in, in, in his original languages. So there, there's just important aspects of things that, that can be missed um, that are worth revisiting uh, to, to say that he has a more sophisticated uh, view of a theological point of view than is often um, noticed. Um, and he's not just a proxy for Martin Luther's perspectives in all respects, um, but he, he actually engaged with Catholic sources and, and had a faith. Now, at the end of his life, he, he famously refused uh, communion on his deathbed. Um, but what he said to his friend, uh, Emil Bozen was his name, uh, is that he didn't want to receive the Eucharist from a government official. 
because of the Danish state church was in his viewpoint also that it was just another department of the government. Uh, he, he didn't want to receive the Eucharist from a state official. He wanted a priest. So there, there's even sort of debates about how to interpret his final gesture of, of refusing the Eucharist on his deathbed. Um, people in um, certain respects said, well, that's a sign that he's a, no, he's a non-believer and he doesn't want to. But then there's other angles to say, well, actually, it could have been a position of faith that he, he didn't think that it was legitimate or something so i don't know that that's uh we'll leave it <laughs> at that point uh, for, for now yeah that's great thank you joshua and um another issue that i want to touch upon with you is this emphasis on beauty and uh, this is something i really appreciate in bishop byron he's sort of leading with the beautiful in his ministry with the word on fire and I think that's really important. And uh, the late kind of Roger Scruton would often talk about beauty at a time contrasting it with much of the ugliness of modern culture and um, buildings and everything are <laughs> quite monstrous nowadays. I, I want to speak to that um, and what someone like your God might say to us today and how his work sort of plays off and critiques von Balthasar and his theological aesthetics and so on. That makes sense. Yes. Um, so, I mean, I, I think, I mean, if you ever get to visit France, uh, I, I totally recommend it. And you go go to all the places that Bishop Barron tells you to go to. Go to the Saint Chapelle in Paris, and go to Chartres, and see these magnificent cathedrals. Um, they are beautiful. Um, I think the the point that Kierkegaard draws out is that our our understanding and and norms of beauty change from one generation to the other and that variability um works against the claim that beauty is a transcendental property because our understandings of a change from time to time or whatever um so yeah what young girls grow up thinking is is beautiful or men or whatever th that changes now obviously you want to sort of get beyond that to true beauty genuine beauty and things like that um but i think kierkegaard has has a more critical view of how the aesthetic can stand in for the religious that that because his his critique is that with the religious perspective it's an engaged perspective it's it's one that's that has a bearing on the course of one's life whereas with the aesthetic if you're walking through a museum watching looking at different paintings they, they are beautiful but your your observation is disinterested it's it, you're just looking at something on the wall that's nice oh that it might be even moving for that moment but then we go on and with our lives and and we don't change our lives but immediately just by going to an opera or listening to nice music or, or watching a thing, it can be transformative. But usually Kierkegaard's point is that we often have a dispassionate uh, stance towards the aesthetic, whereas the religious is an engaged one that, that uh, has a bearing on the course of one's life. Um, so I think much of Kierkegaard's critique of beauty is, is just about that, that it's a, it's a way to, um, his, his critique of it is that, it's not an engaged approach. It, it can be a stand-in for faith in certain ways. Um, so that that sort of would set him at cross purposes with the Catholic theological approach to beauty um, in certain respects. Um, but then again, there's places in Kierkegaard where he talks about the goodness and beauty of creation, his emphasis on the lily and the birds and how he views these as images of God. So there's a the theological aspect of of image uh, in in the way that he deploys uh, his response to nature, um, but also biblical figures like Anna or, or mostly women in the Bible that he draws out. There's images of of the divine that Kierkegaard will draw upon uh, from the Bible. Um, they're humble uh, exemplars of humility, and especially. Um, <laughs> There's another point that Fabro draws out is, is Kierkegaard's view of Mary, the Virgin Mary, um, which often gets overlooked, but she's also an exemplary figure uh, for Kierkegaard uh, in this respect. So uh, what I've tried to do is sort of highlight the critical aspect uh, that Kierkegaard brings to this perspective insofar as it can be a stand-in uh, for, for the risk and, and engagement of faith, um, but then try to bring it back around uh, to where he might be able to engage 
engage with the genuine sense of beauty um, through the, through the images of creation. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, thank you, Joshua. And it's interesting to me in part because, and this might annoy some people, well, but I think there's a, a major difference in some ways between how I would view art, uh, kind of inspired by folks like Kika in that respect, and how I think, and I don't want to mis uh, misrepresent them or anything, but even Jonathan Pajot, with the way he describes art sometimes, it's as if this, the static art of, say, a certain century, like um, Eastern Orthodox iconography, is the, the perfect example, and then everything from them is a kind of deviation from that. And I think that is actually idolatry. And I think, what, to Kierkegaard's point, actually, the beautiful is the incarnation itself, Christ resurrected, that dynamic a time in history, which then inspires our iconography and uh, like Orthodox icons, the, the, the um, kind of beautiful Gothic cathedrals of the Middle Ages and all, we can appreciate them without making these idols and we can preach to them in a more white, a wider iconic, uh, iconographic way of uh, theologizing. Does that make sense? Or do, do, you, no, it really that? does. It does. And, and, and in some places, Kierkegaard even emphasizes Christ as as sort of the incognito that you wouldn't be able to pick him out of the crowd. That he just looks like a normal person, or whatever. So there's nothing beautiful about Christ himself, as as you know, you wouldn't make a statue of him like the Greeks would, or something like with the perfectly chiseled, you know, the big David or whatever in Italy. Um, so there's that there's that aspect for it, but I think that's that's the right intuition that that it's Christ that is the source of all this culture, uh, cultural artifacts, um, and that, that we're not reducing Christ to the cultural artifact, but he, this is, Christ is generative, the, the Christ mystery is generative of these cultural artifacts. That's, I think that's the right intuition. Um, on, on, on the other hand, at this point in time, uh, with like romanticism and stuff in the 19th century, um, priests are replaced by artists and so uh, it's the artist that gets sort of deified as as the geniuses uh, of, of culture and um and Kierkegaard was critical of that um he felt like that was that was somehow uh false and 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 so he he uses the um, the image of um oh it, it's a an old image is it the the ox flannix is ox or something like that where where there's suffering that's that they're being roasted in flames in this beautiful sort of sculpture of an ox um but the, inside they're being roasted into flames but the they've they've um uh made it so that the sounds of the screams will be transformed in a certain way into music and so this was like an image i think it's an either or um and this was sort of how how his image is that the artist has to suffer for his art and that there's suffering bound up in what we then call beautiful, but but that's not part of human flourishing, and that we wouldn't wish that really on anybody. Um, but then somehow we we hold this up as sort of the 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 image of human flourishing, and then he sort of contrasts that with Christ's self-giving uh, aspect that he undergoes suffering. So it it, it is a it's a major uh, theme in Kierkegaard's writings, um, and I think uh, someone that I've read a lot about. Uh, on this topic is uh, George Pattison, who's who's the Kierkegaard scholar in Scotland, uh, who's written on Kierkegaard and the aesthetic. Um, so, but that said, with all those critiques or whatever, Kierkegaard is also invested in trying to connect the aesthetic and the religious in certain interesting ways as well. So he's a dialectical thinker in this regard, that there's this negative aspect, and then he says, oh, but on the other hand, there's this positive aspect as well. So, and I suppose that's why I, yeah, continue to gravitate towards the thingy because he does sort of spin things in ways that help you see things in new light and uh, think about things in other respects. Well, that's brilliant. Um, appreciate that, Joshua. And before, again, we started recording, I think it was that you mentioned that you're working on some of these intersections, philosophy, theology, and also increasingly theology, and you touched upon Jung and figures like that. I think that's most welcome in some ways, and um, in part because I appreciate your work and what you're doing. Because we live in this kind of therapeutic culture, and whether we like it or not, a lot of people do seem to collapse things into the level of psychology. I've been complaining recently about this, this poisonous 
hermeneutic of suspicion all the time where you try and reduce logic and all these theology and all these things and it's just your personal interest it's just uh, economics it's just your psychological disposition your wish fulfillment and so on and there's no <laughs> proper argument or anything and uh, i wonder if you might speak to that i suppose especially as it pertains to someone like Kierkegaard and how he um wrote about anxiety and uh, how that contrasts with these popular notions of anxiety which again have been collapsed and um maybe where that word has suffered from overuse if that makes sense yeah oh it is it is uh a sort of a dismissive aspect of of things that you can find ways to dismiss various things so that you don't have to engage them that is something that is a feature of uh how contemporary discourse tends to to operate especially and that gets aggravated by the social media sort of oppositional uh things as well um yeah i mean kickguard he a lot i mean there's a lot written on him as a psychologist as like a christian psychologist in a way um so I, i'm thinking of like robert roberts uh robert c roberts has written things and and, and they've even tried to recently root him within sort of a virtue tradition as well uh and and so trying to bring this sort of more historical point of view out uh, so that it doesn't just sort of float th from one suspicion to the other, but that it's it's a rooting Kierkegaard into a historical tradition and see what his contribution is. Um, in terms of anxiety uh, for, for Kierkegaard, it's, it's, yeah, it's freedom's possibility or the possibility of freedom and trying to understand what that means uh, for Kierkegaard is, is, is the part of our task as humans um but it's an unavoidable one so it, it is kind of frightening nobody likes to be anxious um but Kierkegaard takes a theological perspective to it that that somehow anxiety is about illuminating the possibility of of some rule breaking that we might be in the wrong before god in some way but it, it's not in a scrupulous way that would be paralyzing but he he wants to talk about how there's a a way that anxiety can lead to faith uh and how that can open us up to faith because it's connected to freedom um and and the act of faith is that which Kierkegaard famously says that um oh, he paradoxically says that only divine omnipotence can make someone independent and you can only become independent by resting in uh, divine omnipotence, basically. So he plays with this issue. Um, but yeah, opening up this freedom in, in a participated way, it's not sort of in an autonomous way that's blocked off from every other possible influence. Um, this is the work of Fabro that has has uh, kept my attention the most is that he draws out in conversation with people like Martin Heidegger, who are also indebted to Kierkegaard's notion of anxiety and sort of secularizes it, um, it among other things. Um, Fabro brings in the sense of, of our freedom being participated somehow and connected to the the free creator. That there's something about being created in the image of God that we are free um, in a different respect, in a different way, but it comes from God. Our freedom comes from God. And in Kierkegaard's way of talking about anxiety, he famously roots anxiety not as a result of Adam and Eve's disobedience, but already present in the garden in the state of innocence. That there's something fundamentally human about it, and, and his argument is about is pertaining to freedom. Uh, so there's a lot to be said on this point as well, but um, I think I'll, I'll I'll pause at that point. No, that's great. And I think uh, to your point earlier, it also nests him within that great tradition from the patristic era and so on, um, where some of those figures seem to have played with the idea that we are the image, but we're working towards the likeness. And again, there's that dy dynamism in the Christian life and, um, for like, even whenever I was speaking with Jonathan Pajot and Bernardo Castro, one of the key things was uh, Jonathan was hinting at the the new how even though we fall fall into kind of metacognition and stuff like that, as someone like Bernardo would say it, at the end of the day, it's the new heaven and the new earth that it's even greater than before, and I think it, that in some ways speaks to that, and uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, that it's not a return. So Kierkegaard. Uh... He has that emphasis on second immediacy, 
that, it, that it's not just a return to what came before as if, you know, it's all the same, uh, but it's, it's a new, uh, it's something that's non-identically uh, repeated. So that's, that's the kicker guardian move that, that Paul Ricoeur also picks up in his thoughts, but, uh, but no, that's really great. Mm, thank you. And um can you tell us a little more about a uh, Father Cornelio Fabro and why he is significant? From the little that I have read, he's been marvelous, and I've just actually found a piece that you've written about it. I can, I suppose, I can put that in the description also, and um, maybe you take that question on its own. Uh, and if not, a, uh, I would also like to ask you about what context was he writing into, and then how did Kierkegaard inform his work and his Christian witness then? Man, yeah, no, this is this has taken I, for the past almost ten years. I've been working on just this question, um, trying to root Fabro in his Italian context within the twentieth century of Italian philosophy, um, but also broadening him out into contemporary discussions. So he, uh, Fabro, was a a Thomist uh, philosopher through and through. But one of the remarkable things that have ca caught my attention is that he also said that just as Thomas Aquinas was influential for me, so was Soren Kierkegaard, that he put him on the same wavelength. And I've been trying to figure out how that's the case, because if you think of someone like Alistair McIntyre, who's a more recent uh, Thomist, he, he has a dismissive uh, approach uh, to Kierkegaard. Um, and so I was trying, I was always curious of how this, how can a Thomist sort of work this out? So I've been uh, thinking about that, but I think Fabro is interesting uh, as, a, as a philosopher in the 20th century, a Catholic philosopher, he's also a priest. Um, but uh, within the Italian context, um, he he learned Danish so that he could translate all of Kierkegaard's writings. He spent the rest of his life um, translating Kierkegaard's writings from Danish to, to Italian. And uh, the Italian reception of, of Kierkegaard would be unthinkable without Fabro's uh, contribution um, single-handedly just translating all of his things into, including the journals. Um, so it's just a massive, massive undertaking. Um, but Fabro was aware that um, things uh, after Heidegger, Sartre, that, that Kierkegaard was being distorted in certain ways into an atheistic direction. And he didn't, he knew that something was wrong about that. So that was what motivated his, his desire to translate him from the original languages. Within Italian philosophy, um, Fabro is interesting because for a number of reasons, it's, this is in the 20th century, this is in the time of fascism. So you have Giovanni Gentile, who is a devout Catholic, but Mussolini's philosopher. He was in charge of the state education system in Italy uh, on the one hand. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have Benedetto Croce, who is the Marxist, eventual Marxist uh, philosopher. He started out in agreement with, with um, Gentile, but then uh, parted ways politically. Um, and then in you also have sort of Thomistic uh, philosophy in between there as well. So you have Marxism, you have Thomism, and then Hegelianism. So that's that was Gentile's thing. He was of the right Hegelian perspective. And Fabro was growing up in this context in Italy where he had done his Thomas, he, he had done his Thomas, but realized that Thomas has to be, can't be left in the Middle Ages. He's got to be brought forward into the contemporary discussion. But in order to do that, you have to make some amendments, uh, not necessarily to Thomas himself, but you have to deploy him in a certain way. And uh, he had read his Hegel and he had read his Marx and he didn't think that Thomas would jive with any of these. So his discovery of Kierkegaard was really huge because it sort of situated it in this triangle of, of options and emphasizes personalism against the collective and um, has this sort of anti-Hegelian critique against Marx on the left side and, and um, Gentile on the, on the right side. Um, and, and so I've been trying to articulate how this is also brings a critical vantage point for Thomism as well. Um, so I don't know if you've come across uh, the book called Converts of the Real by you, uh, Baring, Edward Baring, Edward Baring. I don't know if you've come across that book, but that's a, a hugely important book that was published a few years ago, tracing sort of the indebtedness of uh, the development of phenomenology in, in the European continent back to neoscholasticism. Um, in, in Leuven, but also in uh, Milan as well. And so uh, th there's just huge currents going on at this time, in this point in time. And Fabro is caught up 
in the Italian this section of it. Um, and there's, there's a story to be told there because he was initially moving to Milan to take up the neoscholastic position there, but it was because of his writings of Kierkegaard that he didn't receive a professorship there and had to return back to Rome. So Faber is this unique character who's open to modern philosophy, very well versed in it, um, and medieval philosophy too, um, but he wasn't accepted among the Thomists of his time period. Um, and the Kierkegaard point was like a sticking point in all directions uh, because of the Hegelian influence of the philosophical perspectives at that point in time. Um, and I don't know, I just think there's some important moves that Faber does in relation to phenomenology uh, with Franz Brentano um, and uh, that's another interesting link because uh, that links up to phenomenology, but Brentano is also connected to Adolf von uh, Trendelenburg, who is uh, important for Kierkegaard's critique of Hegel and move back to Aristotle, which then connects back up to Thomas Aquinas uh, for Fabro. And so there's this weird constellation of things moving in the Italian context that I've been trying to elucidate uh, and bring out so that you can try to make sense of it in a contemporary discussion so that it's not just something small discussion that's happening in Italy but can be traced throughout the continent of Europe uh, and brought forward into discussions uh, contemporary discussions today mm -hmm. that's most exciting thank you Joshua I appreciate the work that you're doing and um, it just makes me lament like I've, well, I already have a long enough reading list for my English books uh, if I could speak French and Italian and these things and read in those languages I would be completely screwed <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've been lamenting the fact I don't know if you know um, Fabrice Cézard, the French philosopher I find him quite interesting I kind of wished there was more of him in uh, English I, I read his little book about the resurrection and uh, I was just like oh, I would like to read this guy more <laughs> I haven't I, I haven't come across him yet no, so I'd often often read that too <laughs> um, but no, there's always more to read there's always more to read yeah, you've given me a few books already in this conversation, and I'm going to have to link them all afterwards. But um, another figure I wanted to explore, another relationship that I wanted to explore with you, if you have time, is between Kierkegaard and Newman, especially pertaining to things like the nature and the role of the church and why a wrestling with this might help us then. Yeah, so one of the things that I've translated is, is an essay that Cornelio Fabro wrote comparing the two of them. And, and there's been a number of people that have compared Newman and Kierkegaard as two 19th century um, Protestant thinkers uh, who take up different perspectives. So um, Newman eventually becomes Catholic in his, his journey, but Kierkegaard doesn't. That's partly because of their cultural context and where they're located. But um, Fabro compares them as sort of a um, Newman as kind of like an internal critic of the church and, and Kierkegaard as a sort of an external critical uh, perspective on the church. Um, they didn't know each other. They didn't read each other. Uh, but, but a number of people have published various things uh, comparing the two of them because they're two standout authors uh, who are theologically and philosophically literate uh, at a deep level working in similar avenues. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of what else can be said. So, I mean, Kierkegaard, Faber is critical of Kierkegaard's ecclesiology. He thinks it's inadequate, but he, he finds ways to, to articulate there's different uh, features of Kierkegaard's theology that would open up his theology in an ecclesiological direction um, given certain points. And so Faber is good about sort of being critical saying, this is not, a Catholic ecclesiology. In fact, he's removing, uh, he, he, he's sort of ramping up the absolute and, and holding up the religious ideal, but removing the access to that religious ideal at the same time. So Fabro's criticism of Kierkegaard is that he provides us with the ideal and in the right way, but then removes the, the means by which we might embody that ideal through the church. Um, so uh, he turns to Newman, on the other hand, to show that um, there's more there in terms of his ecclesiology that's more amenable to, and obviously he, he converts to Catholicism. 
Um, but it is a, a remarkable comparison historically to take two individuals who have sort of sympathetic critical vantage points on specifically the establishment. So Kierkegaard's critique of the church is because it's a state church and, and Newman has a similar critique of Anglicanism uh, as sort of a state church as well. Um, so that's what sort of invites the comparison between the two of them, uh, even though they have different conclusions at the end of it. Um, so uh, the other aspect is that um, Fabro uh, appreciates their Mariology. Uh, so Kierkegaard doesn't have an explicit full, full throated um, Mariology. He has an existential sort of Mariology that he emphasizes. So it's Mary's act of faith, her humility, um, her willingness to go under uh, undergo suffering and things like that, that she's an exemplar. Uh, so it's kind of like an existential Mariology that Fabro draws out, whereas Newman also has sort of a ecclesiology that connects to Mariology in certain ways. So Fabro just is, remains discontented with uh, Kierkegaard on this point that it seems like he has all the important pieces in place, but he just doesn't uh, come to the same conclusion that Newman does. And Kierkegaard or Fabro argues that that's because of Kierkegaard's uh, own context and biography in relationship to Bishop Minster and the Danish state church. Uh, there was just too many obstacles for him uh, to follow through. But that doesn't mean that they're the Catholic uh, tendencies and aspects and sources can't be amplified in Kierkegaard's writings, which is what Fabro is up to. Mm, that's really interesting. I think it's interesting to you in thinking about um from if you look at jordan peterson and his wife even jordan peterson likewise sort of likes to focus on the pieta and mary's role in that and how the that's the kind of feminine a, a archetype equivalent to the crucifixion and so on and um, but again obviously he doesn't have that at least a logical understanding but what's interesting to me at the moment is that his wife has just announced that she is uh, becoming a Catholic next Easter. So um, that's got a few things <laughs> in my mind to think about. But um, back to your book, <clears throat> if we may then, how do you conclude the book yourself then by way of things like resource mod and why does Kierkegaard still matter for all Christians if it's not obvious by now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I finish. I finish just by extending the invitation to to engage in dialogue with these various uh, academic discourses between, um, you know, you have radical orthodoxy and the return to Thomism on on one hand with the theologian John Milbank and uh, Catherine Pickstock, who is also published on Kierkegaard as well. Um, and uh, there's just various currents in in academic theology um, that. It sort of made me think about this as a, as a research topic. And then the, the way I, I conclude the book is trying to invite these folks to have a conversation because they're not necessarily talking to each other. Um, so on, on the other side of the Kierkegaard studies, you have the people who read Kierkegaard only as a philosopher and sort of as anti-Christian. Uh, so there's that sort of aspect of reading Kierkegaard. So I'm trying to sort of pull them into the conversation by saying, no, let's pay attention to his theological points of view and take those seriously. Uh, so there's various uh, conversations going on that I'm trying to sort of bring into the same room uh, because I think everybody who who I'm in discussion with, they, they're aware of Kierkegaard and, and his importance, um, but they get off the bus at a certain point in time and I'm trying to uh, bring folks together. Um, <clears throat> and um, this next book that I'm coming out with now on, on Fabro's approach, Thomistic approach to Kierkegaard's theology, I'm trying to get the Thomists uh, into, the, into the conversation as well with Kierkegaard studies as well. But, We'll see how that aspiration manifests, um, but uh, I've, I, it's something that I felt like I had to write. No, that's brilliant. Uh, actually, my next question was going to be, is there anything major that you would edit in that book or add to it? But I guess you can sort of do that in many ways with the new book. Yeah, so that's that's the interesting thing is like I I, th I thought I was done uh with that and then it's uh, it says so like i did a survey in the first in this book of of the catholic reception um and then in this next book i've 
chosen Fabro, uh, who I encounter in the, in the in one of the chapters in the first book, but just dedicate the full thing to him because once I once I discovered Fabro, it wasn't just like an article here or an article there. There was like a whole mountain of of engagement with Kierkegaard. So I was like, I have to sort of try and make sense of all of this because this is unique. Um, and so I've finally been able to do that. Um, and so I have that, and then hopefully. Uh, yeah, there's still more to come, I suppose, but uh, that's the, the main focus is getting this off to the publishers uh, wow. at this point in time. That's brilliant. And best wishes with it. God, God will, and it'll burst some good fruit. And um, I want to say thank you so much for your time this evening, Joshua. And yeah, thanks for having me. So and uh, yeah, include uh, my my website in the notes there. And if, if there's anybody listening that wants to reach out, you can contact me via email and I'm happy to take the conversation forward that's great and um god will and you and i will be able to do some stuff in ireland which people can look forward to <laughs> yes yeah that'd be great that'd be great god bless you all right thank you